Hi. In the previous video, I talked about how to determine molecular polarity, um, you know, using this idea of adding the um, vectors together and then resulting in a certain value of dipole moment, whether it's zero or non-zero. And if it's non-zero, we call it polar. If it's zero, we call it non-polar because we can't really add vectors in this class. I gave you these simple rules to use um, to predict uh, molecular polarity. So now we're going to use these rules, apply it to an example. The Okay, so the way you want to go about using the rules that I just showed you is in the following steps. So if you're asked to predict molecular polarity, basically what you have to do first is draw the Lewis structure. So everything starts from the Lewis structure. And then remember you learn how to predict molecular structures, their molecular shape, using Vesper theory. So you want to use that again here. So you want to predict what molecular structure is for the molecule or the ion and then lastly you can use that molecular polarity rules that um, I just talked about in the previous slide to help you determine whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar whether it has a dipole moment or not okay and as far as molecular shape I just want to remind you that that uh, those are these uh, names here that uh, you know I mentioned in the Vesper videos okay so if you forget them you can remind yourself here I'm just showing you the slide again so you can pause the video and again look back at this. Take notes. Remember, you want to remember all of these things, right? You want to actually have them memorized. Okay, let's work through an example uh, of using the polarity rules to help you uh, predict molecular polarity. So we have four different molecules here. I'm going to work through a couple of them, and then I'll leave a couple of them for you to work on and answer in the question. Okay, so we'll start with SEO3. Okay, and again, the first step is just to figure out um, the number of uh, valence electrons because you have to draw Lewis structure. So SE is in group six, so there's six electrons there, plus all the oxygens. There's three oxygens, each of them has six, so a total of 24 electrons. SE in this case is our um, is our central atom. So then you have three oxygens bonded to it. And initially, I'm just going to start with something fairly simple. Remember, oxygen has to satisfy the octet rule. So I'm going to start with something that looks like this. Okay? So I have basically four uh, pairs for each oxygen. So then uh, four times three, 12 pairs total. That actually is 24 electrons. So I've used up all my electrons. But clearly, um, it's not correct because the selenium in this case is still not octet yet and remember that selenium is not one of those that can violate the octet rule for having fewer electrons so it has to have at least an octet so in other words I'm gonna draw something like this okay so that might be an option for you to draw that's one uh, drawing that would make sense now at this point I want to talk to you a little bit about remind you again that idea of formal charge, right? So remember I mentioned that you can draw, in this case obviously I can draw something that looks like this, but it's also possible for me to draw something that looks like this, right? Okay. That wouldn't necessarily be wrong, even though in this case you have 10 electrons around selenium. So you say, well, I have more than 8 electrons, wouldn't that violate the octet rule? Well, selenium is on the, you know, it's, it's beyond the third period. It's on the fourth period in the periodic table. So it has the ability to accommodate more than 8 electrons, as we said before. So this structure is not necessarily uh, wrong in comparison to this structure. Now remember what I said before, whenever you get into this type of situation, these are what we call non-equivalent resonance structures, and this is the time when you should use that formal charge rule to help you pick out the best structure. If you think about it, um, in this case I can draw one more, I'm going to just draw one more non-equivalent uh, non resonance structure which has all double bonds in this case, okay? And then what we're going to do is show which one is the most uh, probably the most likely structure in this case okay so one two three right here we already know that this one doesn't work now let's actually determine the uh, structure the um, structure that makes the most sense the lowest structure in this case so you have to do some calculation of formal charge I'm gonna do this really quickly because I assume you already know how to do this from prior lessons uh, if you do this, uh, remember selenium is 6, so minus 4, in this case it's a plus 2, okay? 
this one is a minus 1, this one is a minus 1, this one is 0. Now remember we talked about formal charts, we want them to be as close to 0 as possible, we really don't want them to be 2 or higher than that. So in this case, you have three of these having formal charges, let's see if we can do better than that. We go to this one, we notice that the oxygen here has formal charge of 0, the form, uh, formal charge of this oxygen is also 0. Formal charge of the selenium now drops down to plus 1, which is good. This one is negative 1. So we've knocked out this formal charge, but we still have two atoms that have formal charges. See if we can do better. We go to structure number 3. Now all the oxygens are 0, and the selenium is also 0 because it's 6 minus 6. So now we have a great structure because uh, from a formal charge perspective because all the formal charges are 0. So this is the one that we're going to pick to use uh, to predict our molecular polarity. Once you get to this point, then what you need to do is is have the um, uh, Vesper table memorized, or have them uh, handy if you haven't memorized them, and start to figure out what exactly is the molecular polarity here. Okay, and again, I'm going to assume that you're fairly comfortable at this point with that. So you have your selenium is your central atom. So you have to count, remember, count pairs of electrons. Remember, these are double bonds, but they count as one effective pair for Vesper purposes. So we got one, two, and three. They're all bonding pairs. So there's three bonding pairs, which means the molecular geometry, in this case, is trigonal planar. Okay? Now, the last thing to do is to then look up that molecular polarity rule and see what this molecule should be, whether it's polar or nonpolar. Now, remember, there's only two types, uh, there's two types of molecules that could be nonpolar. One is if they have one, you know, the central atom has all bonding pairs, which this one does, and all the terminal atoms are identical, which this one also does, okay? So this fits rule number one in that molecular polarity rule. So without going any further, I would say this molecule is nonpolar, this SEO3 molecule. Or another way to say is it has uh, no dipole moment, okay, or zero dipole moment. So that would be the answer to that first one right there. Let's look at a second example now, which is, uh, let, I'm going to pick PCL3 now as my second example. So PCL3, again, we have to predict polarity, so we're going to start with lowest structure. P has five electrons, CL has, uh, th uh, there's three CL in this case, each CL is seven, so 21 plus five is 26 electron. P is in the middle, CL, CL, CL. And generally speaking, these halogens at the terminal position, they're all going to have octet. Okay, so two electrons each around the CL. So if you count all of these, you get 24 electrons, meaning that you still miss two. I'm going to put that pair right in the middle. Okay, and again, in this case, then I'm going to, you know, obviously I can draw just an analogy to the previous structure. I could have drawn something like this as well. Okay, right? and adding more and more double bond, just like I did in the earlier structure. The question is, should I or not? Okay, and, and again, to help you answer that question, you have to look at the actual formal charges of these, um, each of the atoms and see if when you move from this structure to that structure, you improve the formal charge situation. The reason we look at formal charges in, that, in this case is because you know, these atoms can violate the octet rule. So they're, therefore, we use formal charts as a guide as far as whether we should uh, draw one way or the other, okay? If you look at the calculation of formal charges here, real, just real quickly, you, you find that all of these uh, atoms right here, chlorine and the phosphorus, they all have zero formal charges. So there's one, two, three, four, five for the phosphorus, and five is the free valence, so you get zero. If you go to this one, you notice that the phosphorus here is plus 1. This particular chlorine is negative 1. Um, and everything else is 0. Okay? So that means that... Um, okay, so this assumes that uh, 
I put the electrons from the phosphorus here. I can draw it a different way, but either way, basically you're going from something that has zero throughout to something that is not zero throughout, and that's not good. So you're making the situation worse, so you don't want to draw something like that. So you're sticking with this drawing with all single bonds. Now once you're satisfied with that, then what you need to do is then go ahead and try to use that to predict your um, Vesper structure and then your molecular uh, you know your molecular shape and then afterwards your molecular polarity so the Vesper structure here is depends on the central atom so you have how many bonds how many pairs of electrons one two three and don't forget this one right here four three lone pairs I mean three bonding pairs and one lone pair that means the molecular geometry is called it's a tetrahedral uh, electron geometry but it's only three of them are bonding so we call that trigonal pyramidal okay don't forget that the angle is less than 109.5 and then your um, molecular polarity therefore is whether it's polar or nonpolar uh, again, we have to go through that molecular polarity rules that I talked about at the beginning of this video. But if you look here, you have, you know, identical atoms, right? But what's different here with the previous one? Not all of the electron pairs are bonding pairs. So one of them is lone pair, the other three are bonding pairs, which means that it doesn't satisfy rule number one. Rule number one says that it has to be all bonding and all atoms being identical in the outer side. This is obviously not all bonding. Rule number two says that if the structure is uh, square planar or uh, linear, then it's going to be nonpolar. Well, we just said that this is trigonal pyramidal, so it's neither square planar nor linear. So then this is all, this is, doesn't fit that rule. Rule number three says it doesn't fit rule number one and two, then it's polar. Okay, so this molecule will be polar. Uh, as predicted by those rules. Okay? Alright, so I hope this uh, uh, video shows you, uh, this example shows you how to use those molecular polarity rules that I just mentioned here in combination with Vesper and Lewis structures to predict molecular polarity. We'll do some more examples in class.